your spirit that has walked with us all day, you are present with us tonight. Thank you for our Bibles and that we're able to carry them openly and read them openly, discuss the Word of God openly yet, and we thank you for that freedom, Lord. So, Father, may the Spirit of the Lord help us tonight as we read and share and listen and and try to grasp, Lord, what you're saying to all of us. Be with Lyra. We pray that you'll help her to recover from this stomach problem. We don't know what's wrong, but we pray that the medicine will work, and if they need to change it, they'll know what to do. But help her to recover, Lord. Be with Carol and Avery and uh, Marion and Karen that's on vacation. Lord, give them a wonderful time. Just let them laugh and have fun and be encouraged. Be with all the widows of our church, Lord. Continue to look after them and provide for them and their needs. And for all, Lord, that uh, just need a special touch, we pray that tonight, Lord, your grace would be sufficient. You will help them in all areas of their life where they need your help. Help us all tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are finally back to where I thought I would be teaching three weeks ago and uh, kind of a hitch and a giddy up and we ended up here tonight. We're in Luke 11, but before we get there, I want to take you to two verses that the Lord laid on my heart in John chapter 3 that very seldom do we ever get to. But I think that this would, there's two verses here I want, I want us to look at momentarily until we, before we get into Luke 11 that I think will shed light on all that we'll look at tonight in Luke 11. So in John chapter 3, verse 19. Somebody read verse 19 out loud for us, if you would, please. We know John 3, 16, 17, 18, but we seldom ever talk about 19 and 20. So somebody... If you found John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. <laughs> men love darkness. Why? Their deeds are evil. And what happens when you turn the light on? You can see them take off. They're like cockroaches <coughs> when you turn the light on, and mice. All policemen know that when the light goes down, crime rates go up. I mean, that's just a given. But in some communities, they're so brazen, it doesn't matter. They will steal in broad daylight and commit crimes. But predominantly, when darkness falls, crime goes up. Same way with this. Jesus is making a very spiritual application here. Men love darkness because... The light exposes what they're doing, so they hate the light. Look at verse 20. Everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved, because the light exposes what they're doing, and that makes them mad. They don't want anybody singling them out. They don't want anybody pointing the finger. They don't want anybody accusing them. Their deeds are evil, but they don't want to be told they're evil, and they don't want to come to the light and be changed. They want to stay in the darkness because they hate the light. Now, that is a very clear picture of a culture that is very prevalent today in our world. Men love darkness. That, those two verses, I think, summarizes Luke 11 better than any other verses we could say. Because where we're going to be in Luke 11 tonight, verses 14 through the end of the chapter, it puts a finger on what Jesus is having to deal with. He is trying to shed light on evil, and throughout this chapter, men are just revolting against Jesus, turning the light on them, or their deeds, and we have this spiritual warfare going on through all of the chapter here, starting in verse 14. 
Verse 14 says he was casting out a demon or a devil and it was dumb, meaning that the demon was withholding this individual from being able to speak fluently. It's a garbled speech, whatever's coming out, it's muffled, it's, it's just chaos, whatever grunts or groans are coming out. And the demon was suppressing the voice of this one, and Jesus cast him out, and when he, the demon left, then this individual was able to speak, and it says, and the people wondered, meaning that they were astonished, Jesus had the power more power than the demon. Well, that's why he came. He said he came to get, uh, set the captives free. Well, he does an exorcism. He expels the demon. He causes this individual to speak. Satan and his spirit is gone from this individual's life. But in a, immediately, what happens in verse 15? They say he cast out, uh, out demons by Beelzebul. They are accusing him of being what? I guess a demon. Or a, a follower of a demon or a devil. I mean... Well, it's really, it's all the above, everything you're saying. He's, they're accusing him of being a charlatan, that he's really not operating in the realm of God, he's operating in the realm of darkness, and they're accusing him of being a deceiver, he's all, deceiving all the people and leading them astray, he's not following God, he's not teaching the ways of God, he's really up to no good, he's, he's using powers that is demonic, to cast out demonic spirits. All his signs and wonders and miracles are done with the dark forces of hell. He's an imposter. He is not one sent from God, but one of the devil, thereby trying to discredit any good thing that he's doing. They will never acknowledge Jesus as for anything good he's done, but they constantly find fault and blame him and discredit him, trying to deceive the masses. Don't believe this guy, he's a fake. <clears throat> I kind of wonder what they would have done if he'd have just drawn a light and walked, <laughs> you know, out of the sky. <laughs> That's what we would have done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, is, that is a very good statement, Charles, because in verse 16, they ask for a sign from where? That would have been very appropriate at that point in time if he would have called down lightning and just sizzled some of them. He said, there's your sign. Jesus is doing signs and wonders every day in front of them. And they won't believe any of them. They'll say, well, now, now show us another one. And he opens somebody's eyes. No, that's not good enough. No, there, there, there. Oh, well, he raises the dead. Well, that's not good enough. Now we want another sign. And he feeds the multitudes. Thousands and thousands of people are fed. No, we don't believe that. Over and over and over, every day, there are signs and wonders and miracles happening, but they just won't believe. And now they, they say in verse 16, show us a sign from heaven. We don't, we're tired of all this other stuff. Show us something in the sky. Not right here in front of my nose. Show me something in the sky in the heavens. We want you to make it pink or blue or green or do something up there that we can show as a visible sign. You know what? It's, we're on dangerous ground when we start putting demands on God. Say, so now you, you have to do this and you have to do that. We don't demand of God. God demands of us. Okay? Don't ever get that turned around. It's not for me to put, put demands on him and say, now you have to do this. You're obligated because I told you to. <laughs> no, that's not how it works, is it? Verse 17 through 26, Jesus exposes the hypocrisy and the fraudulent accusations. <clears throat> One of the greatest tools the devil has got is slander. 
They can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. They can't. So what do they do? They slander him. And they try to tear down his good name. They are malicious in this. And that is one of the most seditious things about slander. When you're talking about people and you're destroying their good name. Tearing them down. Simply because you can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them or they can't, you know, it... So that's the only thing they've got left is to destroy somebody's credibility or to spread lies about them. And that's exactly what they're doing here in verse 15. They can't do exorcisms, but because Jesus does, the only thing they've got left in their arsenal is to run him down. That's, that's dangerous ground, isn't it? When faced with the truth, they'll almost always retaliate with personal slander. It's a smokescreen to divert attention off themselves and their own inadequacies. But Jesus pulls back the veil and exposes the darkness here. So in verse 27, or verse 17 through 26, Jesus gives us some truths here. What does he tell us in verse 17? Didn't hear you, Kim. He was just saying that he knew their thoughts. He knew their thoughts immediately. And what does he tell them about a house? A house divided against itself. Yeah, he said, uh, you, what you just accused me of is ridiculous. A house divided cannot what? Stand. Yeah, we all know that. We've heard that for a long time. House divided can't stand. He said, if I am casting out demons with a demonic spirit, that's ridiculous because I'm, I would be trying to destroy the work of the devil if I'm really of the devil. That's, that's ridiculous. A house divided cannot stand. If Satan be divided, he cannot succeed. The infighting there that, that they're talking about here is, is just foolishness. It is a ludicrous slander against Jesus that he's, number one, he's working through the power of Satan. He said, that don't work. You're going to have to come up with another idea. <laughs> Number two, he says, if I'm casting out demons through the power of darkness, he says, well, then how are you doing it? Well, there were some in Jesus' day that were doing exorcisms, but he says, if I'm doing it and it's out of the, the dark forces, then you explain to me how you're doing yours. Well, they can't answer that, can they? Verse 20 he said something about a strong man. And he, you know, he's just ripping all this apart, shred by shred, piece by piece. He's destroying this accusation that, they're, that they've made against him. He said, there's only one way for a strong man to be defeated, and how is that? You're tied up. And who has the ability to tie up a strong man? Stronger man. A stronger man. <laughs> this, this is not rocket science. This is, pretty, this is pretty straightforward. If you've got a strong guy that comes in there and ties everybody up, the only way he's going to be subdued is somebody stronger comes in, stronger than him. So Jesus says, Satan is the strong man, but who's the stronger man than him? God. God. And that's why you go back to verse 14 where we started, Jesus takes authority over the demon and expels the demon and casts him out because he is greater, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Jesus takes authority over the devil, sends him packing. He said, if I was doing this exorcisms by my own strength or by uh, the devil, this never would have happened. This guy would still be in bondage. And I would be in bondage. But Jesus is free, free to minister. And then in verse 23, he says, there is no neutrality in this fight. Somebody read verse 23 out loud. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Exactly. He says there's only two forces in the world. Don't, don't, don't. 
confusing. Forces of good, forces of evil. He said, you're either working with me or you're working against me. You're either gathering with me or you're scattering what I'm trying to do. And he is leveling that to people who claim to be of the religious establishment. That's who he's talking to. He's not talking to people who have never uh, entered the door of the synagogue. He's talking to people who profess to be walking in light and they are in darkness themselves. Well, he gives us some insight here now that, that if we didn't have it, we would uh, stumble here. This is a dark passage. It really is. But he stays with this thought because he's up against people who are just combating him right here in this passage that they just won't give it up. Verse 24. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished, and then he goeth and he taketh with him what? Seven other spirits. Seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is what? Worse. Worse. He's worse off than he ever was before. We're going to unpack this. There is a lot in these couple verses and if you've got a question here, you be sure and ask it because I don't want to skip over this. Jesus pulls back the veil and exposes some stuff that if it wasn't for these couple verses, we would be scratching our head on some stuff here. So let's take this apart. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, how or why would an unclean spirit leave someone? They fell away from the belief that they had. Well, no, 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 don't, you're, you're okay. way ahead. Oh. Go back to verse 24. Okay. Why would an unclean spirit leave? Driven out. They are driven out, they're cast out, they are exercised. <clears throat> or, or that person dies. If that person dies, that demon is going to look for a new home. It's going to go look for a new host, someone else to indwell. So you only have two options. <clears throat> the demon is cast out or the person dies. If the person dies, the demon goes and looks for somebody else to indwell. If that demon is cast out, that is only <laughs> by a stronger one than the demon. And that is only by the power of God that that happens. A demon is not going to leave somebody just because they're tired of this host, this person that they're dwelling. They're going to go find somebody else. They're bored with that. No, that's not going to happen. They're going to stay there and that person is just only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So, with that in mind, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, meaning that he is cast out, and we could use verse 14, just for a hypothetical. Jesus cast out a demon of that guy. If you just wanted to use him for an example, he cast him out, he, the, the demon is gone, okay? Verse 24 says that demon goes looking for somebody else to indwell. What? How is it possible for a demon to come into somebody? That was my question. How does a demon get in a person? By an open crack. By an open crack. And what would an open crack look like? Uh, it could be a just different sin, a sin, and you don't ask forgiveness for it. Well, I mean, in that gives him a heart giving in to sin. Yes. Giving in to sin, you are going to open the door for the old devil. And we always said, don't give place to the devil. Remember that? That verse, don't give place to, need to give place to the devil. People who do things open themselves up to, if you get involved in some addiction or some sin or something, you're opening the door for the devil to get a foothold in their life. 
And it may begin as a habit, but I'm not going to say it's demonic. It's, it's demonic at that point, but there will come a point in time where you're giving the devil a foothold to move in. So, he goes looking for somebody that is already getting tangled up in sin, and he's going to get a stronghold there and indwell them. But after he goes around and he doesn't find anybody there, he says in verse 24, I wonder about that guy I just that I got kicked out of. I wonder if I could go back. I wonder, I wonder if I could try that. I wonder if I could get back in to his life. In verse 25, when he comes, he finds it what? Clean. Swept and garnished. What does garnished mean? Clean. Clean. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment because there's a word that Matthew includes in this that Luke doesn't. So, if you would hold your place here and go to Matthew 12... Matthew 12. And let me find the verse. 44. Yes, thank you. Tells the same story. Mark gives us the same story, but Matthew does something here. Let's go back up to verse 30. 43, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return unto my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he finds it what? Unoccupied. Empty, swept, and garnished. That's King James. It probably something different than yours. There is a word that Matthew uses that Luke doesn't. What is the word? Empty. That is the key to understanding all this. The key to putting this little side note all together is that word empty. Something was there and now it's not. It's empty. Luke leaves that out. He doesn't include that. Matthew includes that word empty. Meaning that there was a point in time when the demon was cast out, a new presence is there. After a while, the demon says, maybe I can go back. He comes out, and the other presence that was there is no longer there. So therefore, the demon can take up residence in that because the Spirit of God is not there. Do you understand where, the, where we're going with this? I don't want to just gloss over it because... Demon possession is such a deep subject, but if you are a if you are a Christian, you're walking with God, he is not going to come in and, and, and dwell in you because the Spirit of God's dwelling in you. But if you lose the Spirit of Christ and that Spirit departs, the devil can come back in again. An empty vessel. An empty vessel. If the Spirit of God is in your heart, you are not an empty vessel. But if the Spirit of God has departed, it's possible. And what would be the end result? Worse. He comes back. Brings some people with him. <laughs> he brings back worse spirits with him. And the end result is that person who claimed to at one time have an encounter or profession in Christ is now actually worse off than before they ever said, I believe in Jesus. So anybody that believes that, 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 that it's impossible to backslide needs to read this verse because Jesus taught this. Well, how? We, we just opened up a whole lot here. So let's, let's be careful that we don't create more questions than we're providing answers. How is it possible for somebody to be cleansed, swept clean, garnished, and then a day come and the Spirit of God is not in them. How is that possible? They would turn their back against God. That's turn their back heart. against God? I'm praying for a person. And 
he has a brother. They were both Christians. They were both into ministry. They were in an accident. And the one is free and still ministering. The other one got attached to the drugs and everything. And now he's awful. He can't get free. Wouldn't that be the same instance right there? That could apply. Very well could apply. I know people who at one time walked with God for whatever reason got hurt. They hardened their heart. Blame God. They walked away. Don't they blame God when they get so hard-hearted? Yeah. And uh, today they're worse off now. And the truth is if they die in that condition they will be held accountable because they they heard the word, they responded to the word, and they walked away from the word. Hebrews is clear about that. Well, that's a picture of somebody who made a profession in Christ, was cleansed, did nothing to grow and mature really, and to stay with it and follow God. And therefore, over a period of time, the Spirit of God departs. They become empty. They choose to live in sin. And the devil has a field day with them. Verse 29. If, if, if you're, if anybody got a question about what I just shared? I don't want to belabor it, but if you got a question or I've confused you about anything, please say, hey, I don't get that. Jesus is staying with this. And I mean, he's going to stay with it till the end of the chapter. Verse 29. There were people, and I mean, they are packed in there like sardines. Verse 29. And Jesus says to them, this is an evil generation. They want a sign. I'm not going to give you a sign except for the sign of what? Prophet. prophet Jonah. What is the prophet Jonah known for? Being swallowed. Swallowed by the whale. How long was he in the whale? Three days. Three days, three nights. Jesus said, I'll give you that sign. You want a sign? Here's your sign. But I'll tell you what. Jonah went to a very corrupt community called Nineveh. And he preached the gospel, and they believed him. The whole town repented. They, they, they fasted. They put on sackcloth from the king right down to even the animals were without food. And that whole community repented at the preaching of Jonah. He said, if, you, if this generation doesn't get right, someday the day is coming. In verse 32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment against this generation because... Uh, they repented when Jonah preached and a greater than Jonah is here and I'm preaching and you're not believing a word of it. <laughs> That's what he's telling them. Verse 31, he said, the queen of the south, meaning the queen of Egypt, came up, traveled with this big entourage, came to hear Solomon tell the truth. She wanted to hear the truth. He preached truth to her and she believed it. She came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and he said, a greater than Solomon is here. So one day in judgment, if this generation doesn't get right, the queen of Egypt will someday in judgment stand up and condemn them because they didn't believe. So, verse 33, Jesus says, here is a real important word. When you get light in your vessel, what do you do with that light? Let it, shine. Let it shine. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't hide it. Don't minimize it. But let that light shine. Don't be embarrassed uh, and backward about believing in Jesus. That's a good way to quench the spirit. That's a good way to lose the anointing. That's a good way to fall out of fellowship and favor with God. You let that light shine. Verse 34, 35 and 36. He stays with this. The light of the body is what? <clears throat> the, eye. the eye. That is how we see light is through our eyes. Light comes into us. We respond to that light through our eyes. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil... The body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light that's in thee be not darkness. If the whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part darkness, the whole should be full of light, even as when bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. 
He's not making this any easier, is he? <laughs> if our eyes are working, we are able to perceive light. Now, our eyes are not headlights. <clears throat> our eyes are not projecting light. Light comes in and we perceive the light through our eyes. You can take somebody into a dark room. They can have their eyes wide open. They ain't going to see nothing because there's nothing but darkness. But if the light comes in, they can see that. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit illuminating somebody and they're able to come to the light, see the light, respond to the light, acknowledge they need the light, and light comes in because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He's telling us, you be careful in verse 35. That's what he's telling these people. He calls them in a, a uh, wicked and evil generation, verse 29. They are claiming to be people of light, but the truth is they're full of darkness. He's talking directly to some very... Well, we can't name names because we don't know them, but he's talking to some religious people who claim to be full of light, and they are not anything but darkness in themselves. And he's trying to get their attention. Verse 37. He's eating with who? Pharisees. A Pharisee. Verse 38, Pharisee is upset at Jesus. Why? He hasn't washed before. Didn't wash his hands. Ah, what are we going to do with Jesus? He won't cooperate with us. Jesus, for the next five verses, one, two, three, four, five, six verses, uh, didn't pull any punches. He exposed darkness in this man's life. What does he tell him? So the inward parts are wicked, evil. And he used a little analogy. What is the little analogy he uses? Cleaning the cup. Washing the cup. If you're going to wash the dishes and all you do is wash the outside and that's the only thing that you wash, uh, how, how well is the job done? Halfway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would even go halfway. If there's smudges on that glass, uh, but it's clean on the inside, I'm not, it, it, it's not going to bother me. But if them smudges are on the inside... <laughs> That's even more serious. <laughs> Jesus says down here in one of these verses, um, don't you know in verse 40 that he who made the outside made the inside too? Mm -hmm. He's just as concerned about what's on the inside as what's concerned on the outside. And maybe more so on the, out, or on the inside. All the Pharisees were doing was window dressing, basically. They were trying to put forth an image that they were full of light, full of love, full of God. Jesus knows a whole lot better than that because of what's coming out of their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever they're saying, their words and everything, Jesus knows really what's in their heart. And he's re pulling back the veil for this guy to realize Jesus is well aware of what's in his heart. He said, you really, you're not even getting close to what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a great change coming to somebody's heart and their life. You're fixated on a good appearance where tithing, and he's not, he's not abolishing tithing or giving of alms. He's not, he's not giving off that they shouldn't be doing that. But he's saying you're ignoring the most important thing, and that's your heart. Look at verse... Uh, 43, what did he accuse them of? Basically, their pride in wanting the best or be noticed. Or the high place. 
notoriety, their place in society, their place in the church, a title. Jesus said, that ain't going to get you into the kingdom of God. You need a clean heart. As he told Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. They are trying to go around the barn to get to heaven, and Jesus is saying, that ain't none of that going to work. Verse 44, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and what does he call them? Yeah, we don't like that word, but that's what he uses right here. Hypocrites. You are as graves that which appear not. Unmarked, he said, you're like a bunch of unmarked graves. Now, you probably were taught as a child, as I was, you don't walk over people's graves. Remember that? Yes. That's just, you don't do that. That's like desecrating their grave. No, you, you go around. Some cemeteries, it's hard to go through a cemetery and not. If you're going from the, over to here to here, they just pack them in there so tight that it's almost impossible to walk through them. But they were taught, and we were taught, you don't walk on people's graves. But he accuses them as being unmarked graves, that people could be walking over a grave and not knowing that they're doing something wrong. But he said, you're leading people astray, and they don't even know they're being led astray because of the way you're living. Verse 45, one of them, a lawyer, said, now you're preaching at us, and we don't like that. You're stepping on our toes. And Jesus said in verse 46, oh, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Oh. What Bible are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus isn't pulling punches, is he? He is... He got in this in verse 17, and he has not got out of the gas. He is talking about light and dark, good and evil. And he has not left off because he has uncovered darkness in these people's hearts, and they don't like it. And they tried slander, they tried ridicule, they have tried manipulation, They've tried coercion with signs. Jesus is not letting up on this. He says, Woe to you lawyers, for you load people down with burdens grievous to be born, but you wouldn't even begin to try to pick up the burden you've laid on them. You wouldn't even do it yourself, but yet you're putting these laws on them and the restrictions on them and saying this is how you have to live, and you won't live by that. It's almost like politicians in Washington that make rules for us, but they don't have to abide by them. That's what these religious people were doing. Woe to you, you build the sepulchres of prophets and that your fathers killed, and you try to revisit history and say, well, they were wrong, but you keep, nothing's changed. You just, you just keep propagating the same thing. Verse 52, woe to you lawyers, for you take away the key of knowledge. You enter not in. You won't go in yourself. You don't want anything to do with following me. You don't want anything to do with my teachings. But you're actually hindering those who are trying to get in. There are people here that want to get in. You're getting in the way, and you're trying to confuse them and muddle their thoughts and give them a hard time. Verse 52, woe to you. That's a serious accusation. When Jesus said woe, that doesn't mean stop. That it means impending doom. So what is the result of all his preaching in verse 53 and 54? Criticizing him. Putting him down is what I would say is God. Instead of believing and seeing what they've done wrong. Is that not what they're doing? They started opposing him way back when. 
And really that's the, the spirit of the devil that is fighting with Jesus. It's, it's being manifested through the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers and the different ones who are opposing him, dogging his every step from town to town, village to village. It's the old devil working through him. It's not God. It's spirit of darkness. Jesus had enough of it. And he lays the wood to him here in Luke 11 from verse 17. I mean, he is exposing all their plots, all their lies, all their ridicule of him. He's exposing it. He tears their, their logic apart, says, you're wrong. I am not in league with the devil. I am working with the finger of God, which is the spirit of God. I don't know how you're doing exorcisms, but I'm using the spirit of God. And he shows them the way out. And instead of getting humbled in their heart and acknowledging that they're not where he, he is and they need him, instead of being like the one in verse 14 where we started from the very beginning who acknowledges they need help, God, would I come to you in full faith and belief, would you change my heart, change my life, they just get worse. This verse 53. The scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. They have just been scorched by his words, and do you think it changed them? Humbled them? They should have been on their knees in front of Jesus saying, I'm next. <laughs> I, I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you are the one. But their deeds were evil. That's why I started in John chapter 3. If we could go back to that. John 3, 19. This is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's why I started with those two verses. It explains all of Luke 11, 14 to the end of the chapter. Men love darkness rather than light. Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. Because their deeds were evil and they loved darkness rather than light. Let me read you a little story. This comes out of Max Lucado's book called The Applause of Heaven. A man by the name of Annabelle sat in a Brazilian jail cell guilty of murder. He was a weightlifter with bulging biceps, a leathery face, and a tattoo of an anchor on his forearm that seemed to symbolize his personality. But he appeared to soften as the preacher talked to him about guilt and forgiveness and a God who knew everything about him and yet loved him anyway. He talked to him about the home in heaven, something that no executioner could ever take away from him. This man hardened himself at the, at the suggestion that one of the first things he had to do to come to Christ was to admit guilt. Phrases like, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I've done wrong, I repent, was not part of this guy's vocabulary. He didn't back down from anyone, and at this moment he didn't want to back down from God. The preacher asked him, don't you want to go to heaven? The man said, well, sure, I want to go to heaven. He said, are you ready to go to heaven? Well, earlier he might have said yes, but he'd heard the preacher share enough verses from the Bible. He knew he wasn't where he ought to be. He paused for a long time and said, all right, I'll become one of your Christians, but don't expect me to change the way I live. The preacher wisely said, listen, buddy, you don't draw up the rules. This is not a contract to be negotiated. 
Salvation is a gift. It's an undeserved free gift, but to receive it, you have to admit that you need it. The man paused and finally said, okay, but don't expect to see me at chapel services on Sunday. When Jesus comes into somebody's heart, the Bible says they are changed. Old things pass away. All things become new. If somebody makes a profession to come to Christ and nothing changes, what do we say? Didn't get much. Nothing happened. Because anybody who becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, there is a great change that comes in their life. Now, they may look the same, but down the inside here, they're, they're a new creature in Christ. Old things are gone. Every, new vocabulary, new life, new attitude. Everything changes when a person is born again. The Spirit of God will begin an instantaneous change in their life. Jesus has been walking around these people for several years now. We are probably in year two, late into year two of his ministry. They've been around him, they've heard him, and all they want to do is argue and argue and argue. And yet they profess that they're right with God and they're ready to go to heaven. That is a clear picture of a lot of religion in America today. I don't know if you're aware of it or not. There are denominations that are teaching that there is no devil. And if there's no devil, then... You're, you just wiped out Genesis chapter 3. There's no fall. And if there's no fall, we don't need a Savior. If there's no fall, there's no such thing as sin. And nobody needs to repent. And when people die, we just all go to a happy place. And we don't need a Savior. We can bypass the cross because there's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as evil. There's no such thing as a devil. You would be surprised if you knew the denominations are actually teaching that and people are swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. But join me in Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Somebody read out loud verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Did you catch that? Woe to those who call good, evil, and evil, good, darkness, darkness, light, and light, darkness, and bitter is really sweet, and sweet is really bitter. Satan has been changing the labels on everything for centuries, the beginning of time. No, God didn't say that. This is, this is, this is what he's doing. He's really holding out on you, Eve. <laughs> you can eat that fruit. It won't, it won't hurt you at all. You won't die. <clears throat> He's been changing the labels on everything that God declared good. He said, no, that's bad. What God said is, is bad. And Satan says, no, that's good. The, he's changing the labels on everything. And the world has just took it hook, line, and sinker. To the point that when you and I stand up and say, well, that's wrong. They say, well, who are you to tell me that's wrong? <clears throat> And all of those that were Jesus is talking to in Luke 11, you can apply that right back to Isaiah 5. He has put his finger on something and said, you've been reading the wrong label. This is how you get right with God. This is how you have a clean heart. This is how you walk in the light. This is how you come to the light. This is how light will change you. When the light shines on something, it expo expels 
exposes the darkness. Jesus has pulled back the veil and has showed them that he knew what was in their heart, and they didn't like that. And that is why at the end of Luke 11, they are absolutely, vehemently furious with him because he's got the goods on them, and they know it. And the only thing they can do is slander him and try to destroy him and tear him down. You and I have the Spirit of God in us. When the light that we have reveals something in our heart, what do we do with it? We, we re say, Lord, forgive me if I was wrong. We apologize. We repent. We make things right. We go to people and we, we go to God. We, we do whatever we have to do to stay in that light. And that is how we continue to walk in that light. And that light continues to get brighter and brighter and brighter until the perfect day is what the Scripture says. That's a tough passage to show, slog through, if I could use the word slog, soldier through. But he put his finger on some stuff here that the people then needed to hear and probably people in our day and time need to hear as well. Is there anything that I went over way too fast and you didn't get? Or I spent way too much time on it and I put you to sleep? <laughs> He's battling some dark forces that's gathered around him and they are just bent on taking him out. They want to silence him. They want to destroy him. They don't like the fact that he's putting his finger on stuff that's in their life and in their heart. I don't know anybody likes to be told that they're doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, when God tells us something, we need to, we need to pay attention. Chapter 12 is where we'll be next week. Take the time to read this. There's a lot. If you've got a red letter edition in your Bible, there's a lot of red there, isn't it? 59 verses in this chapter. I don't think we'd tackle that whole chapter in one night. If we did, man, we'd have to be here a long time. We won't do that. There's some good stuff here, verse or in chapter 12. So you take the time to read that and uh, work through it. Anything you'd like to add to what we talked about tonight? Or you got a question? They didn't, I think they understood he was telling them, you know, just like our conscience tells us. We don't have, well, we have Jesus in our hearts, but he tells our conscience when we're doing wrong, and he expects us to say, I'm sorry, uh, repent. <coughs> but they didn't even believe that, I mean, they believed he was talking to them, but they didn't believe. They truly didn't believe. No, their whole, it, the end of the chapter, those two verses tells us what's really in their heart. The old devil has got his foot on the gas in their life, and all they want to do is tear Jesus down. Now, you and I, the only thing we can think about is how can I promote Jesus? How can I serve Jesus? How can I love my Lord more? You know, that's, that's what drives us every morning when we get up. It's more about Jesus, what I know. More of his love to show. You know? They are the opposite. And Jesus said, at one point he said, you are of your father the devil. <laughs> and uh, he was not pulling punches. He knew what was in their heart. Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage. It's tough, Lord. And it's hard for us at times to read that and understand it. But, Lord, I pray that the light that's in our heart will continue to grow and grow and grow till it just radiates out of us and that men would see that we love you. Take notice that we've been with you. Father, pour out your spirit upon us. May we walk with joy. May we walk in love. May we walk in the light as we have come to the light. Give us wisdom, Lord, for the days in which we live. Help us not to walk in darkness, but to trust you, Lord, to guide our faltering steps. Bless us. 
Help us. Bless our homes. Bless our families, our children and grandchildren. And Father, may they come to the light if they haven't already. Father, may truly the light of God be shed abroad in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you for being here tonight. I, it's good to be back in church. I've missed you all. Miss church. God bless you all.